experience. Thank you. Uh, super excited to be here. I love the Strand. I come here like every time I'm in New York. Uh, it's one of my favorite bookstores in the country. Um, so it's an honor. Um, before I start, I just want to mention I'm going to be showing pictures. Some of them are uh, kind of disturbing. Also, in some of the readings, uh, there's some bad words because it's prison and prisoners use bad words a lot. Uh, so, um, in uh, December of 2014, I took a job, uh, I applied for a job um, for, as a prison guard at the Corrections Corporation of America. Um, I basically went on the corporate website, filled out an application, um, I didn't lie in the application. Um, I had been writing about prisons for a few years and uh, was kind of always uh, coming up against, um, you know, blockades to, to entry. It's very difficult to get access to prisons. Uh, and in uh, private prisons, this is especially true, um, it's hard to even get information about private prisons because uh, public access laws that we have uh, often don't apply because these are uh, companies, not um, states. Um, so I uh, put in the application. I didn't really think it was going to work. Um, a couple weeks later, I was getting phone calls uh, from prisons around the country. Uh, doing, asking me if I wanted to do an interview. Uh, I did several interviews, and they were kind of like what you would imagine a Walmart interview being. They didn't ask me about why I wanted to work in a prison. They asked me like how I work with others and you know things like that. And they were kind of uh, like trying to sell me the job in a lot of ways. Uh, it was like they were trying to convince me that it was worth it to take a job as a prison guard for nine dollars an hour. Um, private prisons and companies uh, today. Um, hold about 8% of the prison population, about 130,000 people are in private prisons, uh, and then they also control more than half of immigrant detention centers. Uh, since these uh, companies started in the 1980s, there hasn't really been a kind of up-close look at the day-to-day -day life uh, inside, uh, which was you know, part of what drew me to it. It's just this kind of, it was this unknown world in a lot of ways. So I moved to Winfield, Louisiana. It's a town of 5,000 people. Uh, the average uh, income for a family is $25,000. Uh, the last sheriff before I came there was uh, locked up for, for dealing meth. Uh, Wynn is the oldest medium security prison, uh, private prison in the country. It holds uh, about 1,500 inmates. Uh, it's in the middle of a national forest. Um, and Wynn's uh, CCA's uh, contract, I should also say that this company is now called Core Civic. Uh, they changed their name uh, a couple months after I published an article on this. Uh, but they were CCA when I was there, so I'll call them that right now. Um, their contract uh, specified that, that the state had to keep the prison 96% full. Uh, this is common with private prison contracts around the country. Um, the state paid uh, the company $34 uh, per inmate per day. Uh, other in California, they pay much more. Some, some states pay $80 uh, per inmate per day. And then it's also traded on the, the stock market. Um, I spent uh, f four months. This is not working. I wasn't supposed to have sound, but anyway. Uh, I spent four months in the prison. Uh, while I was there, I, um, I used uh, these hidden uh, camera device. Um, I had this watch, which has a little tiny camera on it. I bought it on the internet for like $35. And uh, this pen, which records audio. So the pen, um, I would record audio the entire time that I was there. Um, and I did this because uh, I couldn't take many notes. I did take some, but I couldn't be taking notes constantly. You know, um, I wasn't other people didn't know that I was a journalist. Um, I also didn't want to kind of uh, be recreating dialogue. I wanted uh, it to be verbatim. So in the book, um, almost all of the quotes in the, the sections about my time undercover are exactly what the people said. I went through a month of training. Um, and in training, we were told that part of our job was, uh, as guards, was to deliver value to our shareholders. Um, oftentimes, this meant that we were, uh, you know, meant to to protect the company's uh, liability uh, by doing the bare minimum and also not uh, doing things that would uh, be potentially costly to the company, uh, like getting ourselves um, uh, injured. 
So I'm going to uh, read just a little section here. Uh, this is for my second day of training. Mr. Tucker asks what we should do if we see two inmates stabbing each other. I'd probably call somebody a cadet offers. I'd sit there and holler stop, says a veteran guard. Mr. Tucker points at her. Damn right. That's it. If they don't pay attention to you, hey, there ain't nothing else you can do. He cups his hand around his mouth. Stop fighting, he says to some invisible prisoners. I said stop fighting. His voice is nonchalant. Y'all ain't gonna stop, huh? He makes like he's backing out of a door and slams it shut. Leave your ass in there. He turns to face us. Somebody's gonna win. Somebody's gonna lose. Hell, they both might lose. But hey, did you do your job? Hell yeah. The classroom erupts in laughter. We could try to break up a fight if we wanted to, he says, but he wouldn't recommend it. We are not going to pay you that much, he says emphatically. The next raise you get is not going to be much more than the one you got last time. The only thing that's important to us is that we go home at the end of the day, period. So if th those fools want to cut each other, well, happy cutting. CCA was founded in the 80s, uh, but it was not the first uh, company to run a prison. Uh, for most of American history, prisons uh, were actually meant to turn a profit, uh, either for private companies or for the state. One of the first private prisons uh, was actually in Louisiana in the 1830s. Uh, even before that, uh, northern penitentiaries were uh, making a profit to the state by uh, contracting out uh, the labor to, to private contractors. I realized, you know, after I did the, the undercover investigation that uh, there was still a lot more that needed to be, to be uh, said and learned. Um, so I went deep into kind of the history of for-profit prisons by... Um, going through uh, newspaper archives by digging up old penitentiary reports, uh, reading old books, memoirs I could find. Uh, and so the way that I wrote this book is it's kind of um, a double narrative where there's uh, the narrative of my time undercover, and then uh, in alternating chapters, I tell the history of, uh, of the relationship of profit to uh, the development of American prisons uh, from the American Revolution up till now. So I'm just going to, I need to skip a lot of that, but I'm going to just kind of explain how private prisons came about in the South um, in uh, the middle of the 19th century. Uh, the South initially was resistant to the idea of penitentiaries. Um, and I want to point out that penitentiaries uh, were an American invention. Um, they, you know, we, we've had jails throughout civilization, um, but jails were places where uh, people would be held um, for a short amount of time until they went to trial, and then they would be either punished by some form of capital punishment or they'd pay restitution uh, to their victims. Uh, but prisons were, you know, uh, a place where people would be punished by serving time uh, rather than, you know, being hung or pilloried. Uh, and Southerners uh, were, were resistant to the idea of the penitentiary because it challenged their kind of white supremacist ideology. Um, because they knew that uh, the penitentiary would be mostly for white people because African Americans were punished on the plantations. So if white people were going to the penitentiaries, they were going to be forced into labor. This was what the model of the penitentiary was at the time in the North, was uh, it was forced labor. Um, everybody who went to the penitentiary was, was laboring uh, dawn to dusk. Um, but what convinced... Uh, the legislator in the South to, to open a penitentiary was uh, learning that states in the North were actually making money from their penitentiaries. They were profiting. They were putting money into their treasuries. Uh, so the, the penitentiary in Louisiana was opened in the 1830s. Uh, it was actually subsidized uh, the slave system uh, because the prisoners would, would manufacture uh, clothing and shoes uh, at a, at a discount for planters. Uh, and in, in using the penitentiary, Louisiana was also kind of uh, taking uh, manufacturing from the North. The North was, uh, you know, where uh, the South would send its cotton to be turned into textiles. So it was, it was kind of a way for, for the South to try to industrialize. Um, in a way, penitentiaries were kind of a new frontier for forced labor. Southern, uh, slavery was, was agricultural, um, and there, there started to be uh, actually you know, 
newspapers were writing up uh, in other states were, were doing write-ups on the Louisiana State Penitentiary saying uh, that slave owners should learn from the penitentiary. They should, uh, you know, um, have women and children, they should have mills and have women and children working uh, mills instead of having them out in the fields where they were less productive. You know, so I've, I, when I was researching this stuff, I, I wondered often what would have happened, you know, if the Civil War hadn't happened when it did, if slavery hadn't ended when it did, would uh, this been the kind of model that slavery would have went into as the South industrialized? Uh, this, you know, other states followed Louisiana's lead. Uh, Texas, um, a, a, jail, a, a jail warden in Texas said that the state should open a penitentiary uh, to, uh, he said, to push against the overgrown monopolies of the North. And when it, the state opened its penitentiary, just a few years later after, after it opened, it was Texas's largest factory. Uh, it produced, um, uh, it was the main t supplier of textiles uh, west of the Mississippi in the entire country. And uh, so at this time in Louisiana, uh, Louisiana, New Orleans in particular was uh, the second you know, after New York was kind of the second economic capital of the country. Uh, it had the largest slave market. There was a frontier uh, that was constantly expanding and uh, opening up land for cotton plantations. Uh, Northerners were pumping money into the South. Uh, you know, banks were offering loans. Um, there was a larger concentration of banks in New Orleans than anywhere in the country. And in 1837, this bubble burst uh, and the uh, country went through the first Great Depression. And in Louisiana, uh, the, the penitentiary uh, s stopped making money. It started being a burden on the state. And the state uh, targeted the penitentiary as one of the areas to kind of uh, belt tighten. And it did what, what states do today. Uh, it privatized the penitentiary. So it, it turned it over to a company called McCatton, Pratt, and Ward. And uh, the company basically would run the prison uh, entirely, um, and uh, it would use the prisoners uh, as labor in the factory, and it would give half of its profits to the state. So that was in 1844, um, and it, so the penitentiary had been open for about less than 10 years, and uh, it was this quickly that the kind of the idea that the penitentiary was based on, that it would uh, rehabilitate prisoners through labor, uh, that idea was kind of um, pushed to the wayside. Um, the, there, and this idea was also not, not really tested. You know, there was no, there was no evidence uh, backing up the idea that, that people who were going into prison and laboring dawn till dusk were coming out better or not committing crimes. But at this point, uh, it really didn't matter that much whether it was working or not because the state was making so much money. Uh, by 1857, Louisiana was making the uh, modern day equivalent of $1.2 million uh, or about $4,000 per inmate um, from its penitentiary. So back to Wynn. Um, the, the people I worked with at this prison uh, were mostly poor people from the town. Um, there were a lot of single moms who took the job because they needed health insurance for their kids. Um, there were a lot of kids out of high school. Uh, one guy who I call in the book, uh, Collinsworth, was 18 years old. He had uh, only only other job he ever had was working at a Starbucks. Um, so I'm going to read this scene uh, from my uh, second week of, of training. People say a lot of th negative things about CCA, Miss Blanchard says, that we'll hire anybody, that we're scraping the bottom of the barrel. Which is not really true, but if you come here and you're breathing and you're will you've got a valid driver's license and you're willing to work, then we're willing to hire you. She looks at us sternly. You're going to realize that you ain't getting paid enough for what you're putting up with back there, she tells me. Nine dollars is not a lot of money. You can go get that at McDonald's. For nine dollars, all we really attract is a person who doesn't have responsibilities, doesn't have a lot of bills to pay. If I'm a man trying to support my family on nine dollars an hour, you can't. You got to pay for gas. She warns us that the prisoner is going to remind us every day of how little we make. And then your eyes open up to it. Your mind opens up to it. Then they start to ask you to do things for them because they have more money than what you make in a day. And that's appealing to a lot of people. By late morning, our instructors haven't shown. So Ms. Blanchard tells us we can go to the gym to watch inmates graduate from trade class, where they learn skills like carpentry and plumbing. 
Prisoners and their families are milling around the basketball court with plates of cake and cups of fruit punch. An inmate offers a piece of red velvet to Miss Sterling. People are smiling, laughing. When you see an inmate with a smile like that, it's worth something, the wind coach says to a prisoner who is standing with his parents. I feel surprisingly at ease wandering among the prisoners in my uniform. Keep your head up, an older black inmate in a wheelchair says to me. His legs are stumps. Always know who you is. I'm not talking about coming out of the suit. I'm talking about being in the suit. Everything's going to be all right. He tells me his name is Robert Scott, and he's been there for 12 years. I was walking when I got here, he tells me, had all my fingers. I notice he's wearing fingerless gloves with nothing poking out of them. They took my legs in January and my fingers in June. Gangrene don't play. I kept going to the infirmary saying, my feet hurt, my feet hurt. They said, ain't nothing wrong with you. I don't see nothing wrong with you. He tells me he's suing CCA for neglect, came, claiming the inmates are denied medical care because the company operates the prison, quote, on a skeleton crew for profitable gain. Prisoners continue to mill around. Collinsworth suggests that we order everyone to get on the bleachers. Nah, man, Willis says, looking across the gym. There's only seven of us. We can't take all them motherfuckers right there. Eventually, they sit down and the gym grows silent. They stare, at us, they stare us down from across the room. The tension ratchets up until an inmate lets out a blood-curdling scream. The other prisoners laugh. The coach orders them to form a line in front of us. He will call them to the bathroom one by one to be strip searched before going back to their units. I brace myself as the inmates stride toward us. Several gather around me in Collinsworth and ask about our watches. Some get up close to mine, looking directly into the camera. One, wearing a cocked gray beanie, asks to buy them. I refuse outright. Collinsworth dithers. How old you is, the, man asks, the inmate asks him. You never know, Collinsworth says. Man, all these fake-ass signals. The best thing you could do is get to know people in this place. I understand it's your home, Collinsworth says, but I'm at work right now. It's your home for 12 hours a day. You tripping. You're about to do half my time with me. You stray with that? It's probably true. It ain't no probably true. If you're going to be in this bitch, you're going to do 12 hours a day. He tells Collinsworth not to bother writing, writing people up for the small infractions. They're not paying you enough for that. Seeming torn between whether to impress me or the inmate, Collinsworth says he'll only write up serious offenses, like hiding drugs. Drugs? Don't worry about the drugs. The inmate says the, says the guards turn a blind eye, blind eye to it. They ain't tripping on that shit, he says. I'm telling you, it ain't that type of camp. You can't come in and change things by yourself. You might as well go with the flow, get this free-ass, easy-ass money, and go home. There's a pause. This job, you'll see, it got benefits. Oh yeah, I got some benefits already, Collinsworth says, like health insurance. I'm not talking about no health insurance, I'm talking about some more money. I'm just here to do my job and take care of my family, Collinsworth says. I'm not going to bring stuff in, because even if I do get caught, there's... If, even if I don't get caught, there's always a chance that I will. Nah, ain't no chance. I ain't never heard of nobody moving good and low-key getting caught. Nah. I know a dude's still rolling. He been doing it six years. He looks at Collinsworth. Easy. An inmate picks the podium up over his head and runs with it across the gym. Another throws his graduation certificate dramatically into the trash. The coach shouts, exasperated, as prisoners continue to scramble around. I can't breathe, one shouts. You see this chaos, the inmate in the, in the beanie says to Collinsworth. If you'd been to other camps, you'd see the order they got. Ain't no order here. Inmates run this bitch, son. So in Louisiana, uh, during the Civil War, the state uh, took over the penitentiary, took it back from the company, and used it to manufacture for the war. Uh, and then as soon as the war ended, uh, men across the South uh, who had lost a lot of money by, by uh, losing their slaves schemed, uh, a way, tried to think of a way to keep this system going. Um, one man in Louisiana was named Samuel Lawrence James. Um, and so the 13th Amendment had abolished slavery uh, except as punishment for a crime. So James, you know, thought, well, if the state was uh, leasing, you know, um, convicts to companies and businessmen before the war, why wouldn't they do it now? So he proposed uh, to the state that he would run the penitentiary uh, if the state leased him all of their convicts. Uh, he then bought a plantation uh, that was called Angola, that is still a prison today. It's Louisiana's uh, maximum security prison. 
Um, and he he brought uh, convicts to the plantation. Um, they worked in the cotton fields. He, him and his family lived in uh, the plantation house, and it was an identical uh, situation to what had existed before the war. Mostly, he used uh, convicts to do uh, work on levees and build railroads uh, because he found that uh, they costed 1 20th of the price of a free worker. Uh, Louisiana law didn't actually allow him uh, to work prisoners uh, outside of the prison. But when the state tried to stop him, he just kept his labor camps going and disregarded them. Uh, eventually, the state relented. Uh, he also went six years without paying the state what uh, was due to them by the contract. A Baton Rouge attorney uh, sued him, and he also disregarded it, and the state eventually relented. He had become one of the most powerful men uh, in the state. Uh, this this situation is replicated throughout the South. Uh, one of the people in his position, Mississippi, was uh, um, the uh, first. Uh, what it, I'm forgetting what it's called. The first um, uh, leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Grand Wizard. Yeah, Grand Wizard. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so it wasn't. It also wasn't just the businessmen and the. The planters that were making tons of money, the, the states were also making tons of money. Um, the U.S. Commissioner of Labor reported that uh, average revenues under convict leasing were four times the cost of running a, a penitentiary. Uh, in Alabama, 10% of the state's entire uh, budget came from convict leasing revenue. So this went on for, for uh, decades, four or five decades. Um, in all the research that I did about uh, this history, the, um, the most startling thing that I learned was uh, that convict leasing was more deadly than slavery, and it was, it was just as deadly as uh, the Soviet gulags. Uh, Samuel Lawrence James, James had at least for 30 years. Um, in that 30-year period, about 3,000 uh, convicts died. There are very few uh, plant, uh, slave owners from before the Civil War that had uh, more than 1,000 convicts. And there is no record of anybody letting that number of slaves die. The system of convict leasing, uh, you know, it, it differed from slavery in that uh, the people who were overseeing these, these uh, prisoners didn't own them. Uh, so, you know, in slavery times, slave owners saw the, their prisoners as investments. They saw them as their property. Uh, and now they were just leasing numbers. Throughout the South, the average annual death rate was from 16 to 25% a year. So some states, one in four prisoners were dying. In, in one state, it was 40% uh, one year. Um, there was, I think, this, there's, I have this quote that I think really encapsulates the system. As a Southern man who told the National Conference of Charities and Correction in 1883, he said, before the war, we owned the Negroes. If a man had a good Negro, he could afford to take care of him. If he was sick, get a doctor. He might even put gold plugs in his teeth. But these convicts, we don't own them. One dies, get another. OK, back to Wynn. Um, so I took the job as a prison guard uh, as a way to get inside. You know, it wasn't really my intention to kind of write about um, life as a guard. It was just my way in, um, and I was I was curious about the conditions for for prisoners. Um, but the this position of a guard became all consuming, and uh, the thing that one of the things that started me most about that surprised me most about that job is that, you know, I, I had thought I'd go in, I'd be an easygoing guard, I'd kind of stay out of people's way, and, uh, you know, it would be fine, and I'd just be able to observe what's happening. But I saw myself change very quickly uh, in that position. Um, so this, this prison of 1,500 inmates had 24, 25 guards working a day. So there was just an insane amount of pressure on us. Um, I saw myself, uh, as a result, becoming uh, more authoritarian. I would just get burned out. Um, I would kind of go into work with these um, gripes that I was bringing from the, last, from the day before um, that I had with specific prisoners. And the more time I was there, the more I kind of felt that I was a different person inside than I was outside. And I would go home and feel uh, kind of ashamed of the person that I was um, inside. So I'm going to read one last. Uh, 
scene here. And this is from, I'd been on the job for a while. Um, I had blown up with a blown up, um, on a prisoner, uh, who is referenced here. He, I call him pink shades. Um, and I reconciled with him, but I was kind of in the midst of, of really grappling with this, uh, you know, how to be a guard. My reconciliation with pink shades encouraged me. Every time I have a problem with a prisoner, I try the same approach and eventually we tap knuckles to show, show each, other res each other respect. Still, these breakthroughs are fleeting. In the moment, they feel like a glimmer of a possibility that we can appreciate each other's humanity. But I come to understand that our positions make this virtually impossible. We can chat and laugh through the bars, but eventually I need to flex my authority. My job will always be to deny them the most basic of human impulses, to push for more freedom. Day by day, the number of inmates who are friendly with me grows smaller. There are exceptions, like Corner Store, but were I, were I to take away the privileges Bakel and I have granted him, I know that he, too, would become an enemy. My priorities change. Striving to treat everyone as human takes too much energy. More and more, I focus on proving I won't back down. I am vigilant. I come to work ready for people to catcall me or run up on me and threaten to punch me in the face. I show neither fear nor compunction. Sometimes prisoners call me racist, and it stings, but I try as hard as I can not to flinch, because to do so would be to show a, pre to show a pressure point, a button that can be pressed when they want to make me bend. Nearly every day the unit reaches a crescendo of frustration because inmates are supposed to be going somewhere like the law library, GED classes, vocational training, or a substance abuse group, but their programs are canceled or they are let out of the unit late. Inmates tell me that at other prisons the schedule is firm, that door would be opening up and everybody would be on the move, an inmate who's been incarcerated throughout the state says. Here there is no schedule. We wait for the call over the radio, then we let the inmates go. They could eat at 11.30 a.m., they could eat at 3 p.m. School might happen, or maybe not. It's been years since Wynn had, had had the staff to run the big yard. Sometimes we let the inmates onto the small yard attached to the unit. Often we don't. Canteen and law library hours are canceled regularly. There just aren't enough officers to keep everything going. Guards bond with prisoners over their frustrations. Prisoners tell us they understand we are powerless to change these high-level management problems. Yet the two groups remain locked in a battle like soldiers in a war they don't believe in. Whenever I open a tier door, I demand that everyone show me his pass, and I use my body to stop the flood of people from pouring out. Some just push through. I catch one. Get back in, I shout. I'm writing you up right now if you don't get back in there. You hear me? He walks back in, staring me down. White dude all on my trail, man, he says. I shut the door, ignoring him. You better get the fuck from down here before I end up hurting one of y'all, he shouts at me. You green as a motherfucker. I'm tired. An inmate comes around the control room. Bakel is following him and calls for me to stop him. I stand in the inmate's path. I know him, the one with the mini dreadlocks. I feel threatened, frankly, whenever I see him. This way, I say, pointing back to where he came from. He tries to walk past me. I lock eyes with him. This way, I command. He turns back and walks slowly away. I walk behind him. He stops, spins around, throws his hands in the air, and shouts, Get the fuck off my trail, dog! I know he's testing me. I open his tear door. He walks in, stands just inside, and stares me down hard. I grab the door and slam it shut. Bang! In his face. I turn and step back into the throng of inmates milling around the floor. Motherfucker's going to end up dead, he shouts after me. I stop and turn around. He just stares. I grab the radio on my shoulder and then pause. Was I ever taught what to do when something like this happens? I know how to press a button and speak into the radio, but whom do I call? I think of King, the officer who'd smashed the kid's jaw. Sergeant King, could you come down to Ash? I say into, the, into my shoulder. En route. When he arrives, I take him to B1 tier. I find mini dreads. He needs to get locked up, I say, looking him in the eyes. King cuffs him. I tell him the inmate threatened my life. He needs to go to SEG. What happened? I ain't said nothing, the inmate shouts. I walk away. I go back to chasing the others into their tears. What'd you lock that dude up for, an inmate asks me. Dude was about to go home, another says. He ain't gonna go home now. I walk away, unyielding. In the back of my mind, however, there is a voice. Did you see him say anything? Wasn't your back turned? Are you sure what you heard? It doesn't matter, really. He wanted to intimidate me, and it was about time I threw someone in the hole. They need to know I'm not weak.
So uh, decades into the existence of convict leasing uh, in the kind of early first and second decade of the 20th century, the states start to become kind of jealous of the profits that companies were making uh, from convict leasing. And by this time, there are huge companies. Uh, the US Steel, US Steel, the first billion dollar company in the world, uh, was using thousands of, of prisoners for slave labor in their coal mines. Um, so the states started to buy plantations and run them themselves. Uh, and the revenue would go directly uh, to the state treasuries. Um, this, this system went on for decades, uh, into the 1960s and 70s. Uh, to keep costs low, states would uh, use uh, prisoners themselves as guards um, in, in many places. In, in, in Louisiana, in Angola, uh, that, the, that plantation that Samuel uh, James owned uh, eventually was bought by the state and turned into a prison. Um, and also in Arkansas, they uh, would use, um, uh, give prisoners guns and also whips uh, and use them uh, kind of as, as overseers in uh, cotton fields, um, where prisoners who didn't meet cotton quotas would be uh, whipped or uh, in Arkansas until 1967, they were electrocuted. Uh, for not me meeting cotton quotas. And Arkansas, by the way, uh, didn't ban the whip also until 1967. Um, throughout the South, um, this plantation labor was the main mode of incarceration. This is a, a penitentiary report I found from 1965 in Texas. It just details the amount of money Texas is making from cotton. So this is the world that the founder of CCA uh, started his career in. Uh, Terrell Don Hutto uh, ran a plantation prison in Texas called Ramsey that was uh, the size of Manhattan. Um, he lived on the plantation with his family. Um, uh, he uh, had a, a houseboy, which was uh, an inmate who's almost always black who would uh, serve him and his family. Um, I found some of the regulations uh, that the state had had for, for the use of houseboys uh, in the prisons. And the, they kind of echoed the fear that slaveholders had of their, their house slaves. Um, for example, Hutto's wife was forbidden from conversing with them or being overly familiar. Uh, they were not allowed to wash her underwear. Um, they were not allowed to sit with the family for fear that it would lead to impertinence. Hutto uh, went on. He, he was so good at his job in Texas that Arkansas hired him to run their entire plantation system, uh, prison system. He would uh, start a rodeo there where uh, inmates would, uh, the, the public would buy tickets and um, inmates would play, do these kind of rodeo games like uh, trying to pick a poker chip off a bull's head. Inmates were getting gored. Um, the, Louisiana, by the way, still has a prison rodeo uh, like this. Hutto would be the last person to run uh, a plantation prison at a profit. He was running it at a profit to the state of Arkansas. Um, around the time that he left in the, in the mid-70s, uh, it was the beginning of a huge boom in the American prison population. Um, and this boom in the prison population kind of transformed the, the nature of prisons in the South. Uh, they no longer were primarily labor camps. Uh, they instead were more like human warehouses, you know, the kind of things that prisoners are, prisons are today. Um, and so a couple of businessmen approached Hutto at that time and uh, said, hey, we have this idea. Um, Hutto was, you know, had become known for um, kind of running prisons uh, at a business, as a business, although he was running them for the state at the time. And they said, we want to start this company. Um, and uh, it was the Corrections Corporation of America. Uh, started in, in 1982. Um, it's now a $1.8 billion uh, company. The, um, the prison that I was at, you know, toward, at the end of those four months, it became very chaotic. Uh, it was the most violent prison in Louisiana. Um, in a four-year period in 2015, uh, there were some 200 weapons found. Uh, that was 23 times more than Louisiana's maximum security prison, Angola. Um, Department of Justice studies uh, show that private prisons are more violent generally than public prisons. And by the way, uh, I'm not saying that public prisons are nice. Um, you know, public prisons are very abysmal. 
Um, but it's and it's amazing that there is a system that is uh, even more violent and has has more issues um, than Angola prison in Louisiana. Um, uh, at at Win, everyone kind of hated the company. I mean, guards would always complain about it. And my work partner, uh, Dave Bakel, once said that he wished an investigative reporter would come and investigate uh, the prison. <laughs> and I won't tell you how it ended. Some of you may already know, but um, I had to leave very suddenly. Um, I had to kind of basically flee the state. Um, and uh, I'm going to end with just uh, a comment from my work partner, Bakel. Up with Bauer, you ain't heard. And I go, no. Uh. -uh. He's all over Facebook. He's an undercover reporter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I just, I mean, I was, oh, that was so, that was so funny. <laughs> all right. Um, any questions? How did it feel readjusting to your regular life after you left Louisiana? You know, I was actually surprised at how um, quickly I kind of readjusted. Uh, I came back to California, um, and I kind of, it's like once I left that environment, actually I left, uh, went to Texas from Louisiana, and uh, even just that, like leaving the town, um, I just felt like a different person, and um, I think just, I mean, I don't know, just getting out of that situation. And I think also the fact that I was, I was there by choice, you know, it's not like I was in a very different situation than the other guards there and obviously than the prisoners. Um, and I felt that I, you know, I was there, I had a kind of purpose. So I got back and I just start writing and um, just kind of jumped into that. I assume some of this is in the book, but how did you cope <clears throat> sort of once you were home, had left the office for the day, or mm -hmm. whatever the best way to put it is, day-to-day uh, -day with the stress? I think mean, you, yeah. you talked about how it, it weighed on you and you started to feel like you were becoming more authoritarian. Like, did, were you, I don't know, I could just, if, if it were me, I could have just envisioned like drinking more, yeah. just like something bad happened. I'm just wondering no, how, how that did, was reflected in your I personal life. I drank more for sure. Um, I, you know, Part of it was that I was I was undercover, which meant that I couldn't, you know, I I would meet people like a local bar, but I couldn't really tell them much about myself. Um, so, and you can't really like have anyone who's a friend that you're like hiding, you know, your life from. I tried to kind of hang out with people, but it just felt weird. So it was very isolating. Um, I you know talked to people back home, um, uh, but. I just was kind of grinding through it, honestly. I mean, uh, I was working 12 hours a day, so a lot of it was like going home, eating, drinking, going to sleep, waking up and driving back, you know? Um, and then the days that I was off, I was working, just catching up on notes and kind of doing that stuff. Yeah, I'm uh, just um, a little surprised uh, and, uh, and actually sort of pleased too that you were um, able to to write about this without um, so far as I know any legal consequences I uh, work uh, I teach college at Sing Sing prison and uh, in order to do that I have to sign a contract that I won't uh, write about the place and uh, every time I go there, I, I'm searched. And I have to go through a metal mm. detector. And they always ask me, uh, you know, if I have any electronic equipment. And um, uh, you're not even allowed to bring something like a, a charger in or a USB cord. Yeah. And if you do, um, you can not only get uh, thrown out, but you uh, can also get sued. Uh, so um, I was just wondering if uh, you had to contend with anything like that. Yeah. Um, so 
when I left the company, found out that I was there, that I was a reporter. Um, I, there was a whole year between the time that I was there and the time that Mother Jones published an uh, article that I wrote about my time there. And uh, in that time, the company threatened to sue us if we published. Uh, but, you know, our lawyer felt that they didn't have any basis. I didn't lie ever in that uh, process. Um, and uh, I wasn't doing anything illegal. Um, so they made threats, but um, ultimately they never sued. Um, when the article came out, they wrote a, like a one-page write-up and sent it around to journalists trying to discredit me. But it was, you know, they were saying things like, oh, I should have uh, reported what I saw to my supervisor. Um, but, you know, and, and they offered me a promotion while I was there after two months. So, you know, they, they couldn't really say that I was, like, doing a terrible job. Any other questions? Um, were the plantation um, prisons down in the south, were those segregated? Um, I mean, it changed over time um, when during, they, they were desegregated later than, you know, the south generally is desegregated. I think it happened throughout the 70s. Um, but before that, they were, yeah. So did a prisoner of color have a greater chance of being sent for that kind of labor? Or were yeah, they oh yeah. And most prisoners, I mean, were and are black. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned the size of the town. Uh, was this prison the big employer for the area? And how does um, Core Civic, as it's now, mm -hmm. how do they pick where they build their prisons? And is that part of yeah. their operating method? Um, so the main job job providers in the town were Walmart, the lumber mill, and, and CCA. Um, and uh, I don't know what the story was with this prison and how it, they had got the contract in like 94, I think. Um, but uh, counties would often vie for these contracts and they would offer subsidies to the prison uh, company to open up. So, which also, there's this whole, I didn't talk about this, but you know, th even the notion that private prisons are cheaper is uh, highly debated. Um, you know, when you factor in these kind of things like subsidies, which come from taxpayers, um, it really offsets the, the, the cost. Uh, there are other things like um, in California, um, private prison companies won't take um, inmates with chronic uh, uh, medical issues. because They cost a lot of money. So, the, you know, taxpayers are paying more of those than, you know, so it's, there's all these kind of hidden costs that are very hard to pick apart. Um, it was a lot of great info. So what's next? Is there like a plan to tackle this? Um, what's next with all this great info? Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I'm a writer. Um, but uh, so I'm not, you know, exactly the person to answer that. There are a lot of activists working on this. Um, there are in colleges, there's been divestment campaigns. Um, there was movements uh, during at the end of the Obama era. Um, a, f a few weeks after my article came out, the Obama administration, um, and there was, there was pressure from many angles. You know, my article came out, there were, uh, there were some significant divestment campaigns that had happened. Um, and uh, they announced that they weren't going to use private prisons anymore in the federal level. Uh, when that happened, uh, actually, I think I have an image here. Um, This is what the, happened the day that that announcement was made to the stock prices. Um, and, <laughs> but, but, so they, they dropped by half, um, but uh, then the day Trump was elected, the graph looked like the exact opposite of that, um, the day that he won. And the stock price of this company actually rose more than any company in the entire stock market. Um, and now, and then, you know, in the first couple of months of the Trump administration, um, the Justice Department reversed the Obama era decision. Um, so now they're doing better than they were before. And I actually, uh, I went to a CCA shareholder meeting. I bought a single share uh, so that I could go to their annual shareholder meeting in Nashville. And um, it was the only time I was face to face with these company executives because they would never talk to me. And they were, they were exuberant, you know, they, uh, 
everything was going well for them. They're doing better than they have in years. Um, and, you know, so they didn't have anything to complain about. Yeah. You said you'd gotten um, calls from lots of prisons. Why did you choose this one? Was there some reason you went to this one in particular? And um, are you in contact with anyone inside mm -hmm. the prison, outside, still? Um, so the first part of the question, um, part of why I chose, so once I started getting these phone calls, then you know I sat down with my editors and Mother Jones, and we had much more serious conversations, because none of us really thought this was going to work. you know. So then we met with a lo our lawyer, and so one of the reasons I chose Louisiana is because um, uh, it was just better for us legally. Corporations don't have privacy rights in Louisiana. Um, I didn't know that this was a thing, but corporations in some states have privacy rights and not just individuals, but um, companies. Um, right, and then, and then also Louisiana, Louisiana is the most incarcerated place in the world. Um, so that was also something I was, you know, drew me to it to be in, both inside the private prison system and inside the kind of, you know, in some sense, the largest prison system in the world. Oh, and then uh, your other question. Um, so before I published the article, I reached out to everybody who's in the story. And, you know, I, I uh, changed everyone's names uh, except for people who later gave me permission. So Dave Bakel, my work partner who was on the video, he gave me permission to use his name. I went back and interviewed him again. Uh, I did that with another guard um, and a prisoner who I write about a lot in the book who I call Corner Store. Um, he got out after um, I left. So I went back and met him um, in Louisiana. Um, you know, some of the, I think when I reached out to everyone, maybe around seven people responded. Um, and all of them were excited about the project. Um, most people just didn't respond. So, you know, I don't really know what their reaction is. He's back in prison. Yeah. Yeah. At least he was last I heard. Got time for one or two more? Can you talk a bit about how Core Civic has contracts with ICE and their current role in immigration uh, detention centers? Yeah. So actually, the first um, the first facility that CCA opened was an immigrant detention center. Uh, they actually turned a, a hotel uh, in uh, Texas into an immigrant detention center. They basically turned the rooms into cells. Um, it's always been a big part of their business, but uh, now, for really for the last um, 10 years or so at least, um, immigrant detention has kind of been the frontier of, uh, of these private prison companies. There aren't many states opening private prisons anymore. Um, they're, the private prisons that are there are still private. Um, some states are, Louisiana is privatizing more. Um, but immigrant detention is a, is a big frontier. There's, I mentioned earlier, more than half of immigrant detention centers are uh, privately uh, operated. Um, and I think that's why their stock price went up so much uh, when Trump was elected, was the assumption that there would be increase in immigrant detention. Um, and they run a family detention center um, in Texas. I actually met, there was, the win was, I didn't really get into kind of the whole crisis there, but it just became so crazy that, and there was such little staff that the company was sending in people from other places. So I met people from other prisons. I met some people that worked in the immigrant detention centers too. Um, and they're, you know, guarding children and women and, you know, families. They're, they weren't separated uh, in those facilities, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it seems to be growing. Take one last question. So this is a big question, but to what extent do you think that the problem of mass incarceration is driven by privatization of mm -hmm. prisons, or is privatization of prisons and this whole system more of a byproduct yeah. of mass incarceration? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I do not think that mass incarceration is, mass incarceration is div driven by private prisons. Um, I think, like, Private prisons are a, a result, um, you know, and people always ask me, like, how, how would we stop the use of private prisons? And it, all of this comes from the fact that we have such a huge prison population. Um, 
the the way that these companies started was that states couldn't build prisons fast enough when the prison population was booming. So these companies stepped in and said, you know, we'll do it and we'll do it for cheaper. Um, so, you know, in some ways, uh, prisons are just kind of like the, they're the end of the huge problem that is deeply social. I mean, I, th I think that, you know, when you read the historical stuff, um, I do think that profit had a big uh, role in the growth of the prison system throughout history. But this thing that we call mass incarceration is something that's really just the last 30 years. And, um, you know, states, prisons cost states tons of money now. They're, they're not making money anymore. Um, so it's kind of a, a new problem, but it's, you know, we have to deal with uh, sentencing, uh, mandatory minimums, how long we're sentencing, how powerful prosecutors are, police, uh, racism in American society. I mean, it's, this is kind of like the, the symptom of a, of a deep illness, I think. Thank you all so much for your questions. And Shane, thank you very much for being here thank with you. us. Uh, let's give Shane a round of applause.